Good evening. Welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. Let's all stand as we go to our first song, page number 11. Page number 11, He is Mine. Long before the fall of man, God designed the master plan. He exchanged the sinner for the sinless one. Jesus left his throne on high, came to earth to bleed and die. He said, Father, not my will, but thy. You may be seated as we uh, open up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for today. God, I just thank you for all that you do. I thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. God, we just thank you for another night to be in your house. Uh, God, I pray just be with this time of prayer that we're about to have. God, I pray just hear our requests. God, I pray you just answer them in your time. Uh, God, I pray be with the rest of the singing. I pray you have your hands on the preaching. Lord, as we are going through the books that uh, Paul wrote, God, I pray just give us something out of the word of God here tonight. God, I pray just have your hand on the rest of the service. We love you, Lord, and all you're going to do, we ask all this in the wonderful, holy, and precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, amen. Um, the, uh, I'm, Esau's not here yet, so I'll go over the, um, the prayer list, the, uh, the missionary letter. Uh, the family of the week this week is Jackie Justice. The ministry of the week is the media team back there. And the Church of the Week is Bayville Baptist Church in Bayville, New Jersey, Pastor Andy and Kayla Morris. And uh, that's uh, Pastor Wiedemeyer's old church, the old Christian Bible Baptist Church. Um, the missionary for the week is Andy Schultz. And uh, Brother Schultz, I, I don't, I'm not sure if we announced this yet or not, but Brother Schultz and Miss uh, Jill are coming off the field. They're missionaries to Zambia. And um, they have a great ministry there in Zambia, and I'm kind of sad to see him go. You know, some of these missionaries uh, do a really, really good job, and he was, he was one of them that was very, very um, consistent about communicating with us. We used to get, uh, used to get an update every Sunday morning. Um, you know, they're several hours ahead of us, and so like early in the morning on Sunday morning, um, kind of like a ritual, I would get an update on what happened that Sunday at his church in Zambia. And uh, so I would always, you know, you know, I'd be in the middle of preparing, getting things ready for our Sunday morning, but I always stop for a couple seconds and just read his update. And so I really appreciated his ministry. And he's gotten, um, I mean, he's been through a lot. His daughter, uh, I think her name was Allison. I'm not sure uh, off the top of my head what his daughter's name was, but his daughter was really, really ill, had some kind of, um, uh, I don't know if they ever did find out what it was, um, but, uh, but anyway, they... Uh, the daughter had some kind of a some kind of an intestinal problem, and uh, just uh, she was in a really really bad way for a while, 
and uh, she was in college in Pensacola, and so it was really a bad situation for them for a little while. They're trying to minister to the daughter. Obviously, you know, when you come down to it, you're over on the other side of the world, but your family comes first, and, and you know, the mom wanted to be with the daughter. But um, they got through all that. Uh, the daughter's better, and um, but anyway, uh, he wants to come off the field, and so uh, he underlines here, we are confident that this next step in our lives is being directed by the Lord. And so this, this missionary letter, um, he, he put this paragraph in here um, to be completely true. His, his parents are getting older. His, his uh, parents are 75 and 82. And, uh, but he said, to be completely truthful, there are also other reasons for our retirement from foreign missions. Even in an amazing country like Zambia, ministering in a third world country is demanding both physically and emotionally. As they say, as they say it's not the years, it's the miles. For more than two decades, Jill and I and our children have repeatedly endured tropical diseases like malaria, typhoid, dysentery, glardia, I never heard of that one, dang, dang fever, and more, which have taken a toll on our health. In some ways, we suspect that these diseases battled again and again in our, our children's childhood years still affect their health today. And so, anyways, coming off the field, he's still fairly young guy. I think he's probably in his 50s, maybe early 50s. And uh, so I would imagine he's probably going to pastor or maybe maybe do some kind of work for the mission board. He's with BIMI, and maybe he'll do some traveling and do some things for them. Anyway, we're going to support him till the end of the year. And, uh, you know, the mission board asked us if we would continue supporting him for a little while, and so we will. And then we'll see what's going to happen next with him. So uh, anyway, that's Brother and Mrs. Schultz. Now, um, we also got some other letters. We got a letter from Brother Bowen, and uh, Brother Bowen is our... Uh, he's a missionary to Southeast Asia. What he does is pretty much he's, he's back. He's an older guy. He's, he's back and forth. He's here in the States raising support, trying to, not for himself, but he's a guy that raises money for Bibles. You know, he publishes Bibles here in the States, and then he, he, he's with the container as it leaves the dock here in Texas or wherever it leaves, and then he meets the, 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 the shipment over there in Thailand, and then he delivers the Bibles, and they have Bibles that go to Cambodia, they go to Nagaland in northern India, they go to Burma, and he literally delivers the Bibles to all of those countries. He, uh, he travels around sometimes on the river with the government checkpoints and all that, and, and so when he was here, he, he told us. But anyway, we just got a letter from him, and we're updating that. He talks about the COVID situation and all the problems that it's causing there. And then we got a letter from Brother Savali, and Brother Savali... Uh, is also an awesome missionary and just uh, has, he, he's got two churches over there in Samoa, one in American Samoa, one over in, I don't know, for lack of a better term, I'll call it regular Samoa. And um, anyway, so uh, he's got, and, and they just called a pastor and the pastor, the new pastor for the Samoan church is going to be coming and he's going to be looking to do the next leg, which would be starting another church somewhere else. And so they have a really strong Christian school over there. So anyway, these letters are here if you want to read them. Uh, all of these letters, including the Schultz letter, are will be on the website. These, I think the Savali letter's on there. I'm not sure if Brother Bowen's letter's on there yet. Um, because when I get the digital copy emailed to me, I usually put it on the website right away. Uh, but the Schultz letter's on there also. Um, let me um, give you some updates on the prayer list. You may have gotten... Uh, we have... Uh, we print prayer lists all the time now. We don't print them all the time. We update them all the time because we do the noon Zoom. So typically, whenever I do the noon Zoom, which is now Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we'll do a new prayer list. And uh, so there was one out there. Brother Don was giving them out, but there's, I think we updated it once since then. And so you may not have got the, the fresh copy. There's only a couple of changes on there. Um, so if there's any left, you might want to grab one. But let me just go over some of the changes um, that and I actually just updated this this today. Um, brother Bob asked for prayer for his brother-in-law Dick, who's going for a heart procedure on the 25th, and he's been on the prayer list before. Matter of fact, I had just taken him off. I thought everything was good with him, but um, anyway, he's still having ongoing heart issues. By the way, um, it's not mentioned on there. I mean, she's on here for overall or general health. Um, Camille is on here, but she went to Deborah and. Um, and she went for test, and so pray for that. I think they found out she does have a little bit of blockage in one of her legs. She's having circulation problems, and she's having a tough time walking. 
And so, but it's not uh, the main artery that's in there. So I don't know if you can ask Camille about it, but anyway, just pray for her. Uh, also pray for Brother Bob Fenton. He, he had a biopsy recently. He battles with skin cancer. And um, he asked for prayer that the results would come back okay. We're praying for Cindy Clayton. That's um, my son-in-law, Wes's mom. Um, she had a gallbladder procedure and she's recovering. Uh, Patty asked for prayer for Joseph, who uh, had a colonoscopy and possible cancer. Pray for him. We're praying for my nephew, Tommy. Um, he's got ongoing health issues, but he's, um, you know, it seems like late, he's a young guy. He's in his 30s and early 30s, and it seems like uh, every week I'm hearing about something. He's got trouble with his heart. Possibly his cancer's coming back. So anyway, pray for him. Um, Caitlin's father, or no, Caitlin's uh, uncle, Gene, um, is dealing with problems. He had bleeding on the brain. He fell, hit his head, and he's got bleeding on the brain. He was in the hospital for a while. He's doing better. Uh, he relapsed a little bit, but I think he's doing better again. Um, and I think the rest of these, Peggy has an unspoken health request. We're praying for her. Um, as far as COVID, I don't think we have any, anything new with COVID. We're still praying for Yovani. And we're not getting the updates as often as we did with Yovani. And that, I guess that's a good sign because, you know, when, when he was really, really bad, we were getting updates all the time. And so uh, anyway, so, uh, but keep praying for Yovani and keep praying for Mrs. Leonard. Do you have any updates on Mrs. Leonard? Okay, um, so anyway, pray for, keep praying for her. Her husband's fine though, right? Right. So I, I, as far as I know, most of the people on here, I know Lynette on the bottom, um, you know, she had COVID very early. She probably got it. That's a, a, a friend of uh, uh, James, Giroux, and Sarah. And she got really, really sick. And then she had like the side effects from COVID, just long ongoing problems. And so anyway, pray for her. I think she, she long ago recovered from the virus itself, but she's got a lot of residual issues. You know, like I think some, I, I'm pretty sure she had a stroke uh, as a result of COVID. So, and she was not a older person. She was a young person. So anyway, pray for that. And there's a lot of other requests on there. You can see for yourself. Obviously we're gonna keep praying for our nation. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, the closer we get to this election, the more division there seems to be. And and uh, so anyway, just pray for, uh, pray for all that. Um, and then uh, Lexi Skates asked for prayer for the Narwaki family. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but they had uh, a boy, uh, I think it's a boy, that, um, that passed away at 18 years old at a party. Um, so anyway, that's a friend of Lexi's. And so Lexi asked for prayer for the family. Um, uh, I think that's it. Um, I think that's all the ones, the special ones I'd want to mention. Does anybody have any updates or anything you want me to add? Peggy. Take him off completely or just take yes. him? How about, um, should we keep the Tracy unspoken request on there? I would because it's a very sensitive issue. Okay. Uh, Miss Pat has got a similar situation to that also. Pat Bridges asked for prayer for her sister, Lenora, who's, you know, there's a custody thing with the kids, with her grandkids, and so she might be getting custody. So that's a similar situation. Anybody else? Update or... Or, or a new prayer request. Ms. Uh, Becker, you got a slew of prayer requests on here. You got any updates on any of these, these folks? Is that Rini? How about Mrs. Hoffman? Mm -hmm. And how about Steve? 
recovering from stroke? Ah, I got one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, unless it's cancer, eventually, you know, these prayer requests, just because I keep getting new prayer requests, I got to take them all. So, <laughs> so anyway, go ahead. Okay. What and she's frick too, right? F. Yeah. So health, I guess just breathing issues. Heart health, it's the bore is it she don't know. Oh, yeah, she's got to go to the dentist. Uh, so pray for Cindy that the pain does not know all about that. Boy, I'll tell you what. Teeth pain. Anybody here ever deal with tooth pain? Oh, about, I don't know how long ago it was, uh, I got all my teeth fixed, you know, because we had gone through Bible college and everything else. We hadn't been to a dentist in over a decade. <laughs> And uh, finally just went and got them all fixed and, and praise the Lord, I haven't had it. I used to take uh, Advil by the bucket loads. <laughs> I mean, I, I probably don't have a liver left. I used to take six, eight Advil at a time, four or five times a day, every day for, I mean, this went on for years. And, uh, but praise the Lord, I haven't had to do that. I take maybe one or two Advil a year now. So you know, I'm, I'm thankful for that. If you ever have teeth pain, by the way, don't deal with it. Don't do what I did. I mean, come see us if you can't afford it, because I, I, most people don't have it. I got a guy down in, in, in uh, Summers Point there. He'll work with you. He'll help you. He'll, he's a really, really, really good guy, because I know dental procedures are expensive, but he'll fix it, you know, relatively cheaply, and he does a really good job. He's never hurt me one time, ever, and I'm a coward. So anybody else, prayer request? All right. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and uh, pray for these requests. Pray for anything else. Pray for our nation. Don't forget to pray for Kyle. Uh, I texted Kyle this morning at uh, like 5 o'clock, and he texted me right back. And I said, here's a guy that's up at 5 o'clock. Most times I'll text people, say, hey, I'm praying for you. And I get a request back, uh, you know, two hours later. But Kyle was, I mean, he, he was alive, alert, awake, and enthusiastic at 5 in the morning. So uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, his time. And then you just gave away the location there because now we can figure it out. So, uh, yeah. So, anyway, but it was, um, it was, I guess, late, a, a good time for him. So, all right. So, Miss Tina's going to play and we're going to pray.
to our next song. Page number 506, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, was in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. If you're able, let's all stand as we turn to page number 160. Page 160, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, soul, are you?
you may be seated. All right, uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, I mentioned already the new noon Zoom schedule is Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at noon. So tomorrow, tomorrow at noon, we'll have a noon Zoom. I'll send you a link in the morning if you're interested in joining us. Um, we'd love to have you. And so that is, we're trying to get that like almost redeveloped again um, because it's different and it's, you know, whenever, whenever there's a glitch in some schedule, you got to be consistent about things. Otherwise, it just kind of messes things up. So the school year started. Pray for our school, by the way, and uh, also pray for um, the college over there at Vision. So all that stuff's new. But anyway, so whenever, whenever you do, you know, change the schedule around, it's always a little bit weird. So uh, anyway, tomorrow at noon and then Saturday at noon. Um, also, this Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, I don't know, it says it's 7.30. Wade never changed the time, so we're at 7.30. Um, it, it is a men's breakfast, and so um, I, I, anyway, I'm not going to say any more about it. 7.30, men's breakfast. I'm not sure who's doing the devotion, but uh, you can see Brother Bob about that um, if you want to find out more about that. It'll be a good breakfast. We haven't had a men's breakfast probably since COVID, so uh, it'll be good to get one back up and run it again. I don't think we're going to do them necessarily every month as we used to. For one reason, we don't have Mr. Ed anymore. Mr. Ed's not here. He was the cook, and he was the guy really pushing to do that. And so, but we will do them at least once a quarter. We'll try to get them out there once a quarter. So anyway, this Saturday, 730, uh, men's breakfast. And then also, um, beginning on the 15th, on Tuesday nights, not here, but down in Rio Grande, uh, Brother Basso which is uh, his church is, I think, Grace Baptist Church in Rio Grande, is having a Bible Institute at 7 o'clock. And so if you're interested, you need more information on that, Justin and Wade are, are connected with that situation down there. But it'll be every Tuesday night for 13 weeks. I'm not sure what he's teaching, how many classes he's teaching, but uh, Brother Basso's a pretty brilliant guy, so I'm sure you'd learn a lot going down there for that. And so uh, pray for that. And uh, if you're interested in participating um, then have at it. It's, uh, I'm sure it'll be beneficial to you. I know it's another night of the week, but uh, sometimes people are hungry and they, they can't get enough of the word of God during the regular services and they want more. So, And I'm not sure if that'll be available online. I don't... I think the issue is like they were calling about live streaming. Yeah, so if they're live streaming, it'd be something you could, you could join up with online. Um, also, I, I forgot to mention during the prayer time, Pastor Matt Swikowski. How many of you know who Pastor Swikowski is? Um, Pastor Swikowski, he's a good friend of ours. He's up in Kearney, New Jersey. He was doing something at the church with a, with a circular saw, and, and uh, you know the, the rest of the story. He, he took off uh, the tip of a couple of his fingers. He had actually had to have the first digit of his ring finger removed. And he's one of those guys. He's not content just to tell you what happened. He's got to send you a picture. <laughs> And so he's, he's like uh, Brother Ed. Brother Ed uh, down in North Carolina now, but Brother Ed used to go for uh, Brother Ed used to go for surgery just about every three weeks. He had a surgery. I think that man was operated on probably about thirty times in my time being here. And Brother Ed just would he was not bashful at all. He just lift his shirt up. Hey, look, look, and I'm like, no, Ed, I don't want to look. Don't show me. And he said, no, 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 really, really. And I'm like, no, 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 really, really, and I don't want to see it, so don't show me. But uh, anyway, but pray for Brother Matt, and uh, he had to, he, again, he had to get surgery on that first digit that, that the bone had to be taken off, so I uh, had surgery this morning at 8 o'clock, so pray for him for his recovery. I don't know if he's preaching tonight. I would imagine he's not, but maybe, maybe he is. Who knows? <clears throat> Does he? I know we're in this kind of a text group. There's just three of us in there, me, him, and Brother Dominic Cuso. And uh, Dominic Cuso is brutal. He's, uh, you know, he says, because um, he had to go to a plastic surgeon, surgeon to get his, the tip of his finger fixed. And he said, I can't believe how vain you are <laughs> going to a plastic surgeon for a finger. And he said, I, it's just the way they did it. I didn't set it up. I didn't ask for it. This is just what they did. So um, if you want to know how to give, uh, there's a box back there. Well, there was a box back there. I guess it's on the other side of that partition. And if you want to give that way, you can, or you can give online. And all the information for online giving 
is online. So if you go to our website, it'll show you what you need to do as far as giving is concerned. And we're thankful the Lord has taken care of us with all the changes in the way we give and everything else. The Lord's been very, very good to us. And we're going to thank the Lord for uh, blessing our church. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, just for the opportunity to be in church um, tonight. We're thankful, God, for the fact that you answer our prayers. We're thankful, God, that you meet our needs. And we're thankful, God, that, that you enable us to to give back to you. And uh, God, we just pray that we would be faithful in our giving. And God, we know that uh, part of being blessed by you is, is to be faithful. And uh, Lord, we just pray you continue to bless us and help us. We pray for our church, God, that you would give us wisdom. And uh, you know, we have this building project that is really, we're just on the edge of getting that thing started. And uh, God, we just pray that you give us wisdom regarding exactly what we need to do there. I know the deacons are going to talk about these things tonight. And so, Lord, we just pray that you just be with us with all those decisions. And Father, for missions, and, and God, I pray you bless our missionaries. And I pray you bless us as we make missions decisions. And uh, Lord, uh, you know, Brother Schultz is coming off. And you know, what are we going to do? And Lord, I just pray you'd help us uh, as we think about all these things. And uh, all the different ministries going on here, Lord, we just pray you'd help us to be good stewards, to use the money that you provide for us wisely. And uh, again, God, we're just thankful for everything you do. You guide us and you, and you meet our needs all along the way. You supply all of our needs, and we're so thankful for that. And so, God, we pray that you would bless whatever was offered to you this week and just help us to use it wisely, God. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> going to be, we're going to start out in the book of Acts, where well, the, the, the subject is Paul's writings, but we're going to be in the book of Acts. Uh, I forgot to mention, this Sunday, we are back in action as far as Sunday school is concerned, so um, we're going to be moving back over to the Wimberg building. Mr. Wimberg has very, very graciously allowed us to, uh, to use that building, continue to use that building. I was a little bit nervous about uh, whether we were going to be able to move back in. Um, you know, not necessarily even just because of the whole COVID situation, but, but also, you know, just that, you know, you have people using your building, you get a little bit like, oh, maybe I don't want this, this church in here anymore, and this would be a good time to make the break. But uh, he, he told my wife, he said, absolutely, anytime you want to use it. When I first became the pastor here, um, like within a week, of being the pastor, um, I had uh, Mr. Wimberg called and asked me to do a funeral. And, um, and so the building there in Galloway was like brand new. And, uh, you know, I tried to get out of it. I was like, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a brand new pastor, never did a funeral before. I have no clue what I'm doing. Still don't know what I'm doing. But, uh, but anyway, so he, he, he talked me into doing it. He said, no, this is good. They're, ne they're your neighbors. And, and uh, so I did it, and, uh, and I ju was just commenting to him on the building. I said, boy, this is a beautiful building. I said, man, I would love to have a building like this. He said, I'll give you a key. He said, you can use it whenever you want. And so for maybe 10 years, maybe more than that, 11 years, we, we didn't take him up on that offer, but I always remembered in the back of, the, back, back of my mind that he offered uh, that we could use his building. And so when we got really cramped around here for Sunday school space, um, you know, we called him, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, you can use it whenever you want to use it. He says, I'm just glad that it's being used. He loves when that parking lot's full all the time. He loves driving by, seeing the parking lot full. So anyway, he's just a real blessing, that guy. So pray for Mr. Wimberg. I, when you drive by the building, Gerald got me in the habit of doing this. You drive by the building, and you say, thank you, Lord, for that building. Uh, just because it's, you know, I mean, if we were had to rent something, somebody was telling me, I forget what pastor it was. They're telling me that they're using a building on Sunday morning for just a couple hours a week. And 
the, the rent is like $1,200 a month or $1,500 a month for a couple hours a week of a room that they're using. And so it's just, it's just a blessing. What do you guys, you guys pay through the nose for that? 1800 a month. That's a pretty big room though. And, and, uh, that's a beautiful little building you guys are using too. So, yeah. But that's what you were paying when you were there. Or, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so it's, it's a blessing that we don't have to, we don't have to do that. All right. We're going to start in uh, Acts chapter seven and the, you know, the, the, the series of lessons that we're doing are the life and the writings of the Apostle Paul, life, ministry, and writings of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul wrote at least 13 um, of the New Testament epistles and, uh, and also probably wrote the book of Hebrews, though if he didn't write the book of Hebrews, he was really influential in the writing of the book of Hebrews because it's got kind of Paul's stamp all over it. And so I consider Hebrews to be Pauline. So if you throw in Hebrews, it's 14. So, you know, you have 27 books in the New Testament, and so more than half of them are written by the Apostle Paul, if we include Hebrews. So it's a good chunk of the New Testament. And so we want to learn a little bit about the guy who wrote them. Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit of God is the author uh, of the entire Bible, as well as all the letters that Paul penned. Uh, but still, it's just interesting to follow his life and ministry and, and learn what made him tick and, and, uh, and then see, you know, because you can see the human hand also. So when we think about, you know, New Testament writers or Bible writers in general, you can see they're different. The, the writings are different. Uh, one author, God, the Holy Spirit, but yet their individual personalities come through um, in the writings. And so, you know, you can tell something written by Peter versus something written by Paul. And so we want to learn a little bit about these men. And so we've been talking about Paul's background. We talked about uh, his background as an enemy of Christ, or at least we were in the process of talking about that. We talked about his education as a Pharisee. Uh, he was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And uh, the Pharisees were, you know, one of the two main groups of religious leaders in Israel at the time. Again, we didn't see them in the Old Testament. They kind of came about uh, in the silent years in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But he was a Pharisee. And um, we learned a little bit about the Pharisees and what they stood for and how they were different from the Sadducees. And then we talked about his, um, uh, you know, we talked about his, his, his growing up. He was at the feet of Gamaliel and all that kind of stuff. And so now we're dealing with his... Uh, he was a persecutor. So obviously Paul wasn't, nobody's born saved. Uh, some people get saved very young in life. Paul got saved later in life. And he was not just a, your everyday ordinary lost person. He was a guy who hated Christians and Christianity. And um, so he was, uh, you know, he was like, you think of the, the atheist today that's out there that, that hates God, hates Christians, it would be, you know, kind of equivalent, his salvation would be kind of equivalent to the Apostle Paul, same type of a situation. And so let's look in Acts chapter 7, and uh, we'll read um, beginning in verse 54. And I'm pretty sure we didn't cover this last week. I think we just got started with it. Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, you have the stoning of Stephen. Stephen was one of the deacons in the early church, and you see his name uh, listed there in what, Acts chapter 6. And so he's one of the two New Testament deacons that you read a lot about him and Philip. But uh, Stephen's a deacon, and Stephen's a, a, you know, just a faithful witness for the Lord, and he's causing a lot of problems in Jerusalem. And uh, he, he goes before the council, or the Sanhedrin, uh, there in Acts chapter 7, and, boy, he really preaches at him. You see Stephen's entire message there in Acts chapter 7. Well, anyway, he's put to death. And the guy who authorized or consented unto his death, and the guy who stood by and the people that were stoning him to death laid their clothes at this young man's uh, feet, whose name was Saul. Saul was the guy who authorized the execution of Stephen and also stood there with the executioner's clothes. You say, why would they take their clothes off? Well, they're stoning somebody. You're going to get blood all over your clothes. And so they took their clothes off to and put it over there by, by Saul. He was Saul, and uh, his name is also Paul. I was talking to 
uh, Paul Meyer about this. I, he probably had many names uh, because he was a Roman citizen. He was a Jew. Um, and uh, so, you know, it might have been Sergius, Solus, Paulus. And uh, typically that was the case. And some people have speculated at what his full name was. And so anyway, let's begin reading in, in verse 54. Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. It says, when they heard these things, and this is the group of Jewish, the, the council and the other people that were there, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him, Stephen, with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stop their ears. So you ever have somebody saying something to you that was just, you didn't want to hear what they had to hear and you just want to close your ears. And um, I, I, I had a crazy situation years ago. There was a grocery manager that was getting screamed at by the, by the store manager. The store manager was screaming at him. And the grocery manager all of a sudden went like this and he started singing. He started going, nah, nah, nah. He, so he could block out the store manager. I never saw anything like that in my life. But he stopped, every time I see that, stop their ears, I, I think about that, and stop their ears and ran upon him, Stephen, with one accord, cast him out of the city, because they wouldn't stone him within the city limits, and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So this is where we first see mention of Saul in the New Testament. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had uh, said this, he fell asleep. So Stephen basically does exactly the same thing the Lord Jesus does. The Lord Jesus is crucified. The manner of death is different. It's still an agonizing, very painful death. The Lord Jesus said, you know, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And I, I learned something, by the way, um, in... Uh, uh, in a class I'm taking, an advanced Greek class, that when it says, and Jesus said, that word said, sometimes it's in what they would call a, you know, it's a point of action. He said it, and that was it. He said it one time. But sometimes that word said is, it's aorist, it's, it's continuous, and, and it goes on and on. It's linear. It goes on and on and on. So Jesus said and kept saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So he's on the cross. He's not just saying it one time, Father, forgive them. It's, it's he, he was up there, and as he was dying, forgive them. People are walking by, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And uh, that just, uh, that made the whole Greek class I'm taking worthwhile, learning that, that little aspect of it. And so, um, so he, Stephen does the same thing. He said, lay not this sin to their charge. Jesus said, forgive them, Father for they know not what they do. So he's very Christ-like in his death. And of course, he, he was looking in the face of the Lord Jesus, who was standing, not sitting, uh, which we see him sitting at the right hand of the Father. But here he's standing. Some would say he was standing ready to receive Stephen. Look at chapter 8 and verse 1. And Saul was consenting. He gave authorization, approval unto Stephen's death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Notice this, though. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So he's arresting whoever he can arrest, and, um, and he wants to, uh, he's doing whatever he can do, especially here in Jerusalem, He's trying his dead level best to put an end to Christianity. Of course, it's the same situation as with the Exodus. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. You cannot kill Christianity by persecuting Christians. You, you, you kill Christianity through prospering Christians. Prosperity is the killer of Christianity. And I'm not saying I don't enjoy prosperity. I love it. Here in America, we're very prosperous. But persecution is the tool that God has used. And God doesn't even, he's not even the instrument. It's, the, it's Satan who is the instrument of the persecution, but he's trying to 
kill the Christians just because he can't help it. He hates Christians. He hates God because Christians remind him of God. And uh, so he hates Christians. He hates, so he, he delights in persecuting Christians. But persecution is the thing. First of, all, first of all, it separates the sheep from the goats. It separates those who are real from those who are not real. But it does something to people. It's kind of like in America. You know, you uh, drop a bomb on the towers at 9-11. And, and what, what, did the, uh, what did the Japanese guys say? The Japanese, when we attack, they attacked Pearl Harbor. What did the Japanese generals say? We have awakened a sleeping bear or something like that. You don't mess with America. And when you start messing with Christians, it, there's just something that revives them on the inside. And so Paul's trying to kill Christians. And the more he's trying to kill Christians, the more revived they're getting. Now, they're scattering. They're running for cover. But they're taking the gospel with them everywhere. And he just gets more and more passionate about wanting to kill Christians. And by the way, you can tell when somebody's under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, when they start getting very angry. It's not a bad sign when you're witnessing to somebody and they get very angry. If somebody's just indifferent, you know, you, I, say, I always say this, we knock doors. 99% of the time we knock doors, people are just like, oh, yeah, thanks, whatever, you know, I'll take it. They shut the door. They don't care. You know, they'll, maybe a half of 1% I'll be there and they'll be like, man, I'm so glad you came. You know, my neighbor, he really, you know, you need to talk to him. And, and I go to this church down the road and they're thrilled about it. But there's a group of people out there too. You know, maybe one out of those hundred doors, they are, they are mad that you're there. And they're angry. And you try to talk to them and they're just getting, they're getting hot with you. That's not a bad sign. Sometimes that's the guy that God, the Holy Spirit's working on. And just as they, uh, uh, Stephen said to this council, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. They're resisting. They're fighting. And, um, you know, most people don't fight. They just don't care. So look at chapter 9 and verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters, permission to go to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, and by the way, you see that phrase, this way, throughout the New Testament, this way referring to Christianity, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So, in other words, he's doing a, a great job trying to keep down Christianity, but really, he thought he was doing a great job. He just kind of scattered the Christians throughout the Roman Empire where they would continue to spread the gospel and uh, so now he wants to travel around the rest of the empire. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 9, I'll read this to you. Um, Paul's rehearsing his testimony. And he said, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things, no, notice this, contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. So we're talking about Paul as the persecutor of Christians. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority or consent, here it says in Acts chapter uh, 7, uh, from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I gave my voice means he voted for their death. In other words, what should we do with these guys? Remember when Peter and uh, John were in the temple and they, Gamaliel stepped up, Paul's mentor stepped up and what he said what he say be careful what you do with these guys he said if if what they're saying is from god you're fighting against god if it's not from god it'll it'll just fizzle out but he was a kind of a moderating voice of reason all right leave these guys alone but paul gave his voice against them when they were put to death listen we not only need to beat them as finally they in in the book of acts they they beat first time they're brought they're threatened but then they get beaten. Paul and uh, Peter and James get, or John get beaten later on, and they 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 rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer as the Lord suffered. But Paul would have been the one beat him, beating him's not good enough. We need to kill these people. We need to exterminate these people. So he said, uh, "I gave my voice. I voted for them to be put to death, and I punished them oft in every synagogue." So not only the synagogues in Jerusalem, but outside of Jerusalem and compelled them to blaspheme. Notice that. Compelled them to blaspheme. In other words, he forced some of them to 
say something against Christ or Christianity or even renounce their faith. And being exceedingly mad, that, that, that's like crazy, not mad like we get mad about something, but mad, crazy, out of his mind, being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So Paul hated Christians. Uh, he saw himself as an angel of God in the extermination of all who profess faith in Christ. Now, this is what John Philip says about the Apostle Paul. He said, Saul was an intellectual giant, far-sighted enough to see that there could be no peaceful coexistence between militant Judaism and militant Christianity. By the way, where do you see this whole scenario? That, that statement right there, think about it. Where do, you, where do you see in our country or our world today where that statement is very, very true? Ultimately, there can be no peaceful coexistence between Islam and Christianity. Ultimately, as one or both grows. Now, Christianity, biblical Christianity is about free will. We'll not force it. But as Islam grows, they may, even the moderates, the moderates will preach some kind of tolerance for other religions right now. But ultimately, they're all about the eradication of every other type of faith out there. And so there is going to be no peaceful coexistence. And Paul saw that. Paul said there's no way that Judaism and Christianity are going to be able to coexist together. Whatever his teacher Gamaliel might have advised about moderation, Saul saw the incompatibility of the two faiths. Either, either Judaism was right and Christianity was apostasy, or Christianity was right and Judaism was obsolete. Saul's birth, beliefs, and background all drove him into a head-on confrontation with the Christians. He concluded, logically enough from his own biased point of view, that Christ was a blasphemer and Christianity a cult. Because Jesus of Nazareth was dead, nothing could be done about him. Christianity, however, was something else. The sooner it was dead and buried too, the better for everyone. I love John Phillips, by the way. If you, you ever get your hands on commentaries by John Phillips, they're, they're just well worth your while. This is what J. Vernon McGee had to say about, about Paul. He said, the other religious leaders in Jerusalem were satisfied after they had run the Christians out of Jerusalem. They were willing to let it stay at that point, but not Saul of Tarsus. He was the one who was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. He hated Jesus Christ. I do not think that the Lord Jesus Christ ever has had an enemy greater than this man Saul of Tarsus. He went to the high priest and said, look, I've heard that a group of them have run off up there to Damascus and I'm going after them. The fact of the matter is that he intended to ferret them out anywhere they went. His goal was to exterminate the Christians. John Pollock uh, wrote an excellent book on the life of Paul. He said this, he said, Paul charged like an animal tearing its prey. This was not the sad efficiency of an officer obeying distasteful orders. Okay, give me an example. Uh, up at uh, Solid Rock, you have the, you know, they, they had the court case and, and uh, you know, the Berlin authorities had to come in and write them fines for having those meetings. Okay, that is the officer um, who was obeying distasteful orders. He, they didn't want to do that. The people up there in Berlin, they, they, they did not take pleasure in having to do that. However, there were other people like the attorney general in our state who was like, make an example out of them. I want them punished to the fullest extent of the law. I want them in jail for, for, you know, I think the fine goes from like whatever the minimum fine is, maybe $500 and the maximum fine is $10,000 and jail time for each offense and the attorney general wants blood. Um, the guys that were delivering the orders, they were like, look, I don't wanna do this, but I have to do this. So again, this is, the apostle Paul was not that guy. Like, I, I really don't wanna do this. He wanted to do this. He was the guy looking for a fight. Um, and so uh, the heart, he goes on to say, the heart was engaged and the mind too with the thoroughness of an inquisitor unmasking treason until Paul's operations had reduced a vigorous citywide community to apparent impotence. His leaders fled or went into hiding. Paul went from house to house, 
then held formal inquiries at the synagogues when the congregation assembled. Every suspect, man or woman, had to stand before the elders while Paul, as the high priest representative, put to them the demand that they should curse Jesus. By the way, I recommend this. There's a movie out, um, The Apostle Paul. It's called The Apostle, I think. The movie's called The Apostle. You can get it. Did you watch it? I think I have it. I think I have it on my Amazon. If you can't find it, let me know. I'll let you sign it on my Amazon account. Yes. Yeah. Jim. It's it's excellent. Luke. He plays Luke, and then the other guy, and you see him in a lot of movies and stuff. Plays Paul, and Paul's in jail. His his imprisonment in Rome. His second imprisonment in Rome. Mamertine prison. Well, second that we know of. Uh, first time was like a house arrest. Second time is Mamertine prison in Rome. And, you know, it's, it's Mamertine prison, just a filthy place, you know, that's just basically a hole in the ground. You lower the prisoners down, and he's there. And Luke used to go visit him in the jail. And, the, you know, there's some fictional aspects to it, too. The, the, uh, the guard uh, gets saved, supposedly. The guy who's in charge of the prison gets saved in the movie. But, but anyway, at the end of the movie, you know, in the movie, Paul is, like, haunted by his remembrance of all the people that he had put to death, that he was responsible for putting to death and persecuting. And at the end of the movie, you see him walking, you see him in, in heaven walking, and all these people that he persecuted, you know, kind of wrap around him. So, I mean, you, you, gotta, you gotta think about this. This man was responsible for destroying families. This man, and by the way, what do you see Paul doing and throughout his writings, he's constantly taking up an offering for who? The poor saints back at Jerusalem. Why, he had, he had made some of those ladies in Jerusalem widows, some of those children orphans. He was personally responsible. By the way, we'll get into this, not tonight, but we'll get into it eventually. One of the reasons I believe that Paul was, was arrested why was he arrested? I go into a bunch of different reasons. And one of the things, they're all P's, but it's principle because of his principle. His principle, he wrote, it's not his principle, but he wrote it often in the scripture, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And Paul was persecuted more than anybody in the New Testament. Why? Well, Paul was the persecutor more than anybody. And so when you see Paul's back in heaven someday and you see those at least 195 stripes because that's second corinthians the second corinthians is about halfway through there's a bunch of stuff written after all the pastoral epistles and the prison epistles are written after second corinthians in second corinthians he's got 195 stripes on his back i mean can you imagine 195 you're talking about a cat nine tails that whips around and it doesn't just hit you square on the back those little tendrils wrap around with pieces of bone metal and all that and just rip I'm sure he's got them all over his neck the side of his face because those guys aren't exactly accurate when they're when they're wailing on you with that well 195 stripes five times 40 stripes save one five times nine is 39 there's no telling how many more he got after second corinthians so when you see him I mean you're talking about a man who was beaten to death stoned at Lystra beaten to death many, many times. But why? It's his principle. Whatsoever a man soweth. And he still didn't get what he deserves. Christians reap less than they sow because we're saved, but there's still a principle there. And so, anyway. All right. Listen, we're going to stop there. We're not getting very far in this study. Huh? Well, it's quarter of. It's kind of time to stop, so. I'll, I'll try to start moving a little bit faster in this study. I just really love this study. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much, God, for just the Bible. Help us, help us to try to, I don't know, not just see or hear, but almost feel what this life was like in the first century. God, it could be that we're headed for a world, I hope not, where Christians are going to face the same kind of persecution again. And I pray, God, that we would appreciate 
the sacrifices made by our fathers in the faith, those first century Christians in Jerusalem and then in other parts of the Roman Empire, what they dealt with, what they faced, and then later on what the Apostle Paul himself faced just for being a Christian, just for being faithful. And Jesus said when, when he comes back, will he find faith on the earth? And I believe the reason why he won't find faith on the earth um, to a large degree, it will be because the persecution will be tremendous. And so, God, I pray you'd help us to, to just gain a greater appreciation for what was given to us. Um, you know, it came to us uh, easily, but it cost a great, great price, not only for the Lord, but it cost a great price for all of those saints that handed it down and those through the Middle Ages that bled and died as well. 50 million people, they, a conservative estimate of people died during the Dark Ages uh, just because they were Christians, just because they were faithful to you. And God, I pray that we would uh, just uh, get a greater understanding and appreciation of what was given to us, Lord. And we're so thankful for it. We're thankful for the word of God and the blood that's all over this book. Not just the blood of the cross, but the blood of the martyrs through the centuries is all over this book. And I pray we wouldn't be so flippant about the way we handle it and treat it. God, I pray you bless. Help us to think about these things, Lord, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.